Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. We've had a little bit of an absence, but we were in London. Uh, we weren't sleeping. We did our first ever live show at Ruler Live. Thanks for all of you that came out to see it and even came across across borders to come and see it. It was great meeting so many of you, and we'll hope to do more things like that in the future. But today, Benji's in a new setup. He's looking good, if you see on the YouTube of this podcast. Uh, today, we're doing uh, wrapping up the awards. Best domestique and best lead out we'll do at the initially, and then best overall rider of the year. The Velo Door Awards came out before the Tour de France route reveal. Very controversial, in fact, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it felt like yesterday. I don't know where the off-season's gone, frankly. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do. And then we'll have a women's award show as well coming up before our team uh, previews, which I feel like we're late this year, Benji, but I swear there's half the teams have don't even have announced rosters. Like, which team have actually finalized their rosters for next year? It's not very many. It's limited, and I think the... The aspect of the, the freezing contracts during the entire merger debacle and all that kind of stuff properly delayed some of the roster announcements. I do remember last year that Ineos was pretty late as well, but I reckon Jayco is probably one of the teams that in my head was complete after the Luke Plapp announcement. There's probably a few teams out there that are fully complete, some that might just be happy with 27 riders or 28 riders and not having 30 riders. So teams that might not seem complete might already be complete. Does that make sense? Yeah, like they don't have to actually announce the full 30 if they're, even though they're entitled to it. I think Cofidis might be full. Lefebvre says they're full, but hasn't announced the 27th rider. I think UAE are full with Del Toro and the other Neo Pros they've got. But yeah, it seems like AG2R, for example, they are waiting to do their big new sponsor announcement and apparently that's when they'll also announce all their new riders, which is rumored to be uh, Victor Le Fay, Bennett, uh, Dries de Bont, and, uh, and some others. So yeah, it's, it's very, very delayed. That might not even be to mid-November, that one. But first, we'll get into uh, best domestique of the year. Leadout's kind of tied into that as well. There's two strands of domestiques, really. There's, well, no, three, I guess. There's your Rouleau domestiques. Your Tim de Klerk, your Van Hoydonks. There's your mixed domestiques. Benoit, maybe Groschartner type operators or Kwiatkowski, uh, Volta. And then there's your pure climbing domestiques. Adam Yates, Sepp Kuss. Um, is there anyone? Who else is a pure climbing domestique? Good question. We've maybe got a long list of riders. <laughs> <laughs> you might be too tour focused. focused. And like, the Kuss and Yates is Jay there, Ryan. but also... Catanel is also a rider where I'm like, he combines the climbing mean, aspect and also yeah. the middle terrain aspect, and also he can ruler quite a bit. But let's start this off with a different discussion. You just mentioned all those names, and you started with one of the names that I didn't actually have on my shortlist for 2023, and that is Tim de Klerk, and he just had injuries, right? I think he had He's a sick, knee injury, no? uh, a hand injury, a heart injury, I don't know, it, it was a lot, and... The fact that he's now finally pushing through and finally coming back, and I think next year he's riding for Trek, or was that then? Yeah, Trek not years. happening, or yeah, okay, I think so. What do you think about him? Can he come back to what he was three years ago? Because he was almost number one on our list for a few years. Yeah, he was, and especially in the peloton. If you asked the riders and did a poll of them, who's the best ruler in the peloton domestique? They all would say Tim de Klerk automatically. Uh, I hope so, but he is uh, 34, turning 35 next March. But, you know, Trek is a good spot for him. I think they really need that guy in the classics. Like, they really, really do need him in the classics. So hopefully yeah. he gets back there. But, yeah, this year, unfortunately, he didn't have the level uh, to be really up there because that role's almost changing. You already mentioned uh, Mat Mattia Cataneo. Like, in the Vuelta, he could do everything. And he was there, like uphill, downhill, flat, unbelievable stuff. I think Bahrain, Bahrain had some good domestiques, or riders that performed in a domestique role and then weren't a domestique most of the year, like Caruso would pull for Lander in the Vuelta, yeah. but wasn't primarily a domestique. These are the riders who were primarily domestiques in their major races. Like they went to Mate. the biggest races as domestiques. Wild Bulls. 
Yeah, sorry, that's that's who I should have thought of better. Wild pools, yeah, <laughs> but then in the tour he wasn't. He was stage hunting, or same yeah. with Mo, not Moritz or Bill Bow. There's not actually that many in the top teams in the top races dedicated domestiques because usually yeah. if they're that good, they can also win races themselves. And then there's you mentioned this off air, Benji. Unfortunately, there's a sort of survivor bias in that. It's tough to remember the domestique work in some of the mid-table teams yeah. when their leader might not get to the final or win the race. Uh, that's all, especially with lead outs. I think that is a big thing, right? Yep, I think so as well. There's there's domestiques you mentioned, Renard, for example, on Coffee. That's the kind of rider where you might not necessarily have him on your list, but he has done proper work throughout the year for Kokar. But just Kokar is just not at the level where he can beat the big guns in the big races and that's the kind of bias we're talking about it's also in the classics for example you might have a domestic that works his ass off for 75 percent of the race but then the leader has an issue either puncture either mechanical either crash or just not good enough and then they don't get to the final and you're like oh that rider might not have helped that much but it's really that first phase of the race that we might neglect a few riders that might be best in that area just because they don't hit the screen as much as the riders we are mentioning. But I think talking about these riders, let's talk about the Ineos Giro ones first. Damon Adensman, Lorenzo Plus. And um, when I look at those two riders, I'm like, Adensman crashed out throughout, uh, throughout the race, which is unfortunate. But I also feel like when it comes to the Plus, he was... A lot better than in previous years. He yep. was great in the years of 2018. 19, I think. yeah, Jumbo. 18, 19. Then he had his like down years and now he was kind of moving up again. And I think this might be the, the level that I expect him to stay at. But I'm also not, a, not really shouting, oh, this rider is versatile on every terrain or showing it on every terrain because he is on paper versatile he won the bing bang tour if i recall correctly on the yumbo years yeah yeah and so cobble shouldn't be that big of a deal then when it comes to climbing he has a solid level we saw that in the giro to be able to be a part of domestique but he's also not sepka's level and therefore he's not in my top three no and also it was only the alps and the giro not you know not his fault he crashed 22 minutes into the Vuelta, so maybe he would have been absolutely firing yeah. in the Vuelta, but the reality is he crashed out. And so, yeah, he's not not that guy. Of course, there's other guys I really feel will go under the radar as well, like a, a Yasha Susselin mm -hmm. or, or riders like that, but kind of the deluxe domestiques are the ones that we should be giving the top three awards to, who are the guys who are standing out in the big races. And Aronsman as well. I think Sivakov crashed out. Aronsman did finish. Aronsman also was riding for his oh, own yeah. result a little bit in the third week, at least in my opinion. Van Wilder as well. Like, you can't be best domestique of the year if you didn't want to go to the Vuelta to be a domestique yeah. for Ramco. Um, so yeah, it's it's necessarily a very UAE and Yumbo uh, stack list, whether that's right or wrong. I think think it's hard to go past it when the tour and the classics and all three grand tours were were dominated by those teams uh, of course there's sir and cry anderson i'd like to give a notable mention to on the poggio mm -hmm. him being on the wheel of pagaccia made was very important because well van art then had to jump he was also i think good in flanders uh but yeah that's a couple of races as well so do you want to get get to your list benji your, or your top three and give your argumentation for it Okay, so when it comes to my actual top three, I actually hadn't put them in order yet, but I'll do so in my head right now. I think Adam Yates deserves to be mentioned. It's difficult with him because he kind of started the Tour de France as pretending co-leader. <laughs> I think that's a, a categorization for that. But when it comes to the actual work he did during the race, he was re he was doing Sepkus better than Sepkus during the Tour de France. That's how I viewed it personally. Sepkus was also really strong at the Tour de France, also proper domestique work. But Adam Yates was able to get further, and that does matter. Now, obviously, so because then, Giro, Vuelta, did all three Grand Tours. Giro was domestique in important moments for Roglic, where Roglic needed him. Then, in the Tour de France, he was still there in moments where Vingegaard needed him. And then, we look at the Vuelta, and then he rises up from that. So, 
he had a moment of like transcending the domestique role into GC leadership in the Vuelta, but looking at his domestique work, he's also one of the best domestiques in the world. But then I have to take a look at Nathan van Hooydonk as well, because I feel like van Hooydonk is there on every bit of terrain, as in he's there in the classics. He's there in important moments in the classics. He's there making splits. He's there being in splits that are made to the point that he's there when other domestiques for other teams might not still be there. And that's sometimes after he's already done the work in earlier phases of the race. And I also feel like in the Grand Tours, he also was often a, a rider that kind of did the Van Barle work or the pre-Van Barle work. Is that a right description? Yeah, he rode before, like on the Tourmalet, he rode uh, the majority of that climb in the Tour. And yeah, as you said, even in Tour of Britain, he was the second last man doing the leadouts. He was in the lead out for, for Koi, uh, not the biggest race, of course, but yeah, he can sort of do it all pretty much except the very, the very steep climbs. And, you know, as you said, Tour of Flanders, who's the man dropping out of Group 1 to wait for Wout van Aert to, when he'd been dropped by yeah. Pogacar and van der Poel? It was Nathan van Hooydonk. I think had... So, okay, so you got... I kind of agree with you, Benji. It's hard to... I almost think of it, Van Hooyong to me is the best rouleur domestique in the world. He's like what de Klerk was. Yep. And then there's like Yates and Koos that are sort of in the climbing roles. Yeah, but Van Hooyong is more versatile than de Klerk ever was. Yes, I feel like. climbs better, he, yeah. On, on climbing, he's better. On classics, he's getting further than de Klerk could. And that matters to me. It sucks that he's out of the sport. Let that be very clear, because obviously he had his, his heart issue that led to that car accident that eventually led to him retiring from the sport but putting that aside he just straight up in my opinion is the most versatile it's difficult most versatile is not really the correct term the most he's, he's there the on most every complete, terrain that he's needed yeah. and yeah van hoydon could help with even because he was so good in the sprint run-ins it meant that Laporte and Van Aert could save their legs rather than helping Vingegaard stay in good position in uh, in the Tour de France so yeah, it's, I also, similarly, Benji, it's difficult for me to have them in any particular uh, order. I, I have Van Hooydonk as the best ruler-type yeah. domestique in the world. Uh, maybe Castro or Oliveira or Erviti in previous years could have also been that, but he, Van Hooydonk, was number one, classics and stage racing and even leadouts. And my best climbing domestique, actually, Yates. Yeah. Yates was, Yates was the best climbing domestique in the Tour. He, he dropped Coos on almost every stage, right? Yep. I'm pretty sure. Uh, except for uh, Marie Blanc, like on Juplin, on Betex. He was, he was really, really good. It was actually just Poggy that couldn't, couldn't finish it off. And then on Lowe's, yeah, he wasn't domestique in one. And then Lombardia, I think he was, in Italian classics, he was outstanding as a domestique. So he's actually my yep. best climbing domestique. I actually agree with your list. And the thing is, like, there are other domestiques in there. Ilan van Welder was really good in LBL, for example, setting up at Emco Evenepoel, and also in the Grand Tours where Emco was, but he's got little opportunity to show it, because in the Giro, Emco was quickly gone, and Ilan van Welder kind of had to fend off for himself, and then during the, during the other races, he kind of got his own leadership role, and also in, uh, in Trevale, where he actually ended up winning, like, it's difficult to give that a full view of domestique. He was good in the ones where he was domestique, but it wasn't many in value, in volume, is what I mean. And there's other riders that Jan Trotnik was a, a really good domestique in the races he was in. Obviously, Trentin, I remember on the, on the Poggio that he was the one that caused the split yeah, on the Poggio yeah. because he lost the wheel on purpose. And yeah. that was a re that's like, that's an indirect move as a domestique by not doing something. That's like, you're helping your leader by not doing something compared to doing something, which is an odd way to look at it, but it's also helping your leader in some shape or form. Exactly. And Wout van Aert is a name that we haven't mentioned a lot. And 2022, he was at the top of many lists when it comes to best Thomas T because he was, he was everywhere, but he's also leader on many terrains. And I feel like he missed something when it comes to Thomas T. He had moments where he was important, the likes of Cole today, Tourmalet combination, being that satellite rider up the road, that type of stuff, being a lead out, for example, into a Britain, although that's a different category, the best lead out segment. But he, he, he missed out on a few things for me to be in that top three. Yeah, he's not there. I would even have like Dylan Van Baal ahead of him, actually, in terms of impact yeah. on, uh, on maybe Vingegaard winning the Tour de France this year. 
or the Dauphiné, for example, or even Volta in the Vuelta or Dauphiné. So, yeah, let us know your list. I think uh, it's interesting how this changes, also how dependent it is on the the team actually finishing it off. We've already said yeah. multiple times that, you know, maybe there's a guy that jumps up next year that is is outstanding. Maybe, I don't know, I'm trying to think of Bora Hans grow up. No, actually, they... We'll see. Yeah, for domestic. Roglic. No, that's a good example. With Roglic sort of a finisher going across yeah. to Bora, will their domestique core become more more obvious, like a Zvihoff yeah. or someone who controls finishes for Roglic might might flow to the top. Anyway, that was domestiques. Uh, in that, there's also best leadouts. This is tricky because with leadouts, especially now, the best leadout riders in the world are not professional leadouts throughout the year. So the best leadout riders... Uh, Matthew Van der Poel, Wout van Aert, Christophe Laporte, they're the three best, but they are not full-time lead-outs. We saw a Van der Poel in the Tour de France really, really good uh, most of the time as a lead-out, but that's not what they do most of the year. And then there's full-time guys like Tilla, uh, Varenskold, Merku, Van Poppel. But th- to me, Benji, they're not as good as those guys. Van Poppel in the Tour was not good without Mullen. I on one end agree, but I also feel like they are very dependent on their sprinter. And if you couple Van Poppel with a sprinter that is likely to finish it off every time, then you're likely going to be impressed by what Van Poppel does all the time as well. Because it also matters the chemistry you have between your lead out and your sprinter. Like, right, like Merku, Jakobsen didn't trust him in a lot of the sprints. And then afterwards we were like, oh, he should have followed Merku in that one San Juan sprint because it would have delivered him in a better position, for example. And I'm like... There's a lot of like these moments where it, it depends on the chemistry between sprinter and the success of the sprinter and so forth. But I agree that my winner is definitely in the two, three names you mentioned. And for me, it's Mathieu van der Poel because, yeah, Tireno, Tour de France, the leadouts that he did for, for Philipson were not the spiky leadouts that we criticized him for back in the day. Back in the day, I swear, when he was doing an Eco Tour leadouts for Merlier a few years ago. At Alpecin, I always felt like he was going to lead out that spike to through a corner by taking a risk that his leader that was trying to follow could not follow to the point that he then lost his sprinter and then Merlier was kind of alone and Merlier then had to kind of worm his way to the front himself and those issues we did not see with Philipson this time to the point that the risks he took like pushing Girmay aside, Binyam aside, helped Philipson which I'm not sure I should be rewarding that type of behavior but on the other end, the leadouts that he did, regardless of that, at Tireno, at Tour de France, and so forth, those were on point, those were top level. And Wout van Aert with Koy as well at the, at, the, at the Tour of Britain, but if we see that at a Grand Tour, I'd rate it on the same level. But it's hard to see it at the same level for me. Yeah, it's not. It's, that's why, with inarguable, if we talk more, and maybe it is a better conversation to not talk about which final lead out was the best but which team yeah. had the best lead outs throughout this year there is no well, discussion it was Alperson Phoenix yes. Alperson de Koenig sorry they won eight Grand Tour sprints in all three Grand Tours they had the best sprint lead out structure throughout the year and that's you know not just with Van der Poel if you look at their guys you might not hear every day but for example uh, Edward Plankard Jimmy yeah. Janssen's uh, Robbie Hayes in, in the Vuelta. Ricard, the return Rick, of. Ricard is third last man in the Tour de France. Uh, they didn't get it right all the time, but they yep. constructed proper lead outs uh, for, yeah, for, all, for all these races, like even Wait. Aldani, Krieger, Leis, and Spiragli, Sinkeldam for the Giro. Are we disrespecting the pilots, the Affinis of the world? Because Affini is a bloody good lead out if he's the pilot trying to get your sprinter to the front solo, but that will not work every time in the highest level of sprints against an Alpecin train. Correct. Like, if you can keep your sprinter around seventh wheel without having to move up and back and up and back and up and back with the washing machine effect in the last three kilometers, he's going to be fresher at the finish. And yeah, you you can win sprints with a, with a one-man army like a Feeney or, or whoever, but is not going to be as consistent. Like in Paris-Nice, for example, we saw Koi 1-1, whereas, uh, I can't remember. Well, that, Paris-Nice kind of mixed around. Melie maybe 1-1, yeah. the first one, Pedersen. But yeah, if you have dedicated lead out, 
well drilled, the right guys for it, even if they aren't, you know, track superstars, you're going to win the most sprints. And I think Alberson, they, win, they take out that award for me. And yeah, I also think Van Poppel, the tour really did knock him a little bit as well for me. But maybe with, uh, with Wellsford, it looks like a different beast next year. Anything else on the lead outs, Benji, uh, before we move on? Not really, to be honest. I think it's clear that Vanderpool was the more, most successful at the highest level. Uh, and I agree that it's not just Vanderpool. It's also the riders before Vanderpool that get Vanderpool and Phillips into the right position and are there to help out. Yes, it's only two lead outs that were successful with Vanderpool during the Tour de France. Two others, Phillips had to fend for himself. But during the, during the Velt, Alpesen also successful. So just like the whole team of Alpesen, I would reward for best lead out, like you mentioned. And I guess that brings us to the next one, which is best time trialist and this is always an interesting one for me because last year we had the world championship winner tobias foss where like let's be honest about it we did not believe that he was going to do that again in 2023 <laughs> we, we didn't want to say all out he's going to be absolute shit in 2023 well i think we did <laughs> okay but um he just he didn't repeat his 2022 is a nice way of saying it even if it was world champion term trial Ghana beat him at the Vuelta, if I recall correctly. Evenepoel barely beat the likes of Thomas and Gigginhardt while having COVID during the Giro. So on paper, I would say that he'd have to beat those guys by half a minute on a, on a healthy day, is how I'd see that time trial. But then you've got the upcoming people like Joshua Tarling, an absolute beast these days. He's not the best time trialist yet, but he might be next year. Yeah, he's, a, he's an absolute beast. And there's, then there's also the GC guys. Tade Pagacha in previous years, maybe. Yeah. Like in 2021, Pagacha, I think, was uh, in the Tour de France, won the first TT, and then was, mm, yeah, like he was closer in other TTs and in rolling ones, he was good. This year, Vingegaard, the best time trial someone had ever seen, people had ever yeah. seen in the Tour de France, like according to Dumoulin. But that's a hilly parkour. So, but then he... You know, yeah, but his, his Vuelta TT wasn't very good and his other... He was sick there. So yeah. that yeah. matters too. At the Tour de France, even the flat sections were really impressive. And I feel like the, the attention to detail in the cornering is what really struck me in that time trial. Because if you, if you took a look at two riders, one of them Vingegaard and one of them a different rider in that time trial, the amount of time that man was taking in corners was super impressive. And... That doesn't mean it's the hills that all, all made difference. The downhills were also making a difference, which is really impressive. But I have a hard time giving this to Vingegaard. I don't know why. I'm just not yeah, giving yeah. best not... ET to Vingegaard. Sorry. <laughs> no, if he not... arrives at the World Championships, he's not winning. Well, that's the thing to knock with Poggy, and even in previous years where he won Tour de France TTs, is that in the sort of one-off TT events like Europeans or Worlds, he wasn't even podium, wasn't podium in. Yeah. He was, you know, <laughs> fifth or twelfth or something. So... Yeah, this is, to me, actually, very... I'm going to go um, very vanilla with this one. And my list is the podium of the World Championships TT. Remco is first. He both won the World Champs TT. He won the two Giro TTs in which he participated, one of which was a little bit uphill. And Ghana is then on the second line for me with winning the, winning the Vuelta TT... Uh, second in that Giro TT where he had to run into Remco and then uh, winning his Tirreno TT. So that to me is inarguable. And then Tarling didn't have the success earlier in the season. Um, for example, he didn't win the Basage TT. Uh, he had to do two team time trials, unfortunately for him in Paranis and the UAE yeah. Tour. <laughs> but then once it got to the second half of the season where he's doing ITTs, he won British National Champs and was second to Ghana in the Wallony World Champs tune-up and he was third in world champs, one Europeans ahead of uh, Bissiger and Van Aert and one Chrono de Nation ahead of Remco, even though maybe some people had been on the beach a little bit, but I think he had as well. So he's my <laughs> third one uh, because yep. maybe in a different year, if Roglic had won a Giro TT and a Vuelta TT and a Olympics, it would be different. But no, I just got the three of the world champs. I agree. There we go. That's it. <laughs> I feel like one category that we haven't really touched on this year was Basque Classics rider, but I feel like we all agree that's Van der Poel. That's Van der Poel, yes. <laughs> There's no discussion Best there. Best one-day rider is Poggy, though. Um, I find that difficult. What, he, he, he beat the shit out of Van der Poel in Flanders? Roubaix? 
Sanremo and Worlds. Yeah. It's also a pretty big one there races, no? Flanders, Lombardia, Flesh, Amstel. Yeah, but I don't rate Flesh and Amstel as high. No. Nah. Worlds is very high for me. Roubaix is very high for me. Lombardia I don't rate as high as the other three monuments you mentioned. What about Classica Hain? <laughs> that's that's the one that tilts it for me. You're right. <laughs> Pogacar is first. Yeah. <laughs> But that, uh, that will bring us to the all-out discussion we're going to yeah, have. Yeah, that's actually a good tiebreaker. Well, maybe I don't. Maybe, maybe <laughs> I don't even believe that myself. I don't know. I actually don't know what I believe. It's difficult, eh? Because like, we're going to talk about best rider, but yeah. should we also talk about best team at some point? Maybe afterwards. It's UAE. They won the ranking. <laughs> no, sorry, I disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> nah, we don't. Like, it's it's Yumbo then UAE and then. Okay. Yeah, that's Let's it. Let's get to the discussion then. The one that we might actually disagree on. I don't know if we will or not. Best rider of the year. You're convincing got, me, I think. Am I convincing you? Anyway, we've got the likes of Pogacar, the likes of Vingegaard, the likes of Van der Poel. Those were, in my opinion, the pretty obvious top three. But yeah. Roglic also has the results to back up a potential fight with the third rider on that podium. And then you've got riders like Philipson who had a really successful season where I'm like... What would a sprinter like Philipson have to achieve to be in the contention to win this? And I, I had a thought about this and I was like, he would have to win the same amount of stage in the tour, the green jersey, he'd have to win Roubaix. Yeah, had to win Instead Roubaix. of second. And next to that, he probably would have to do what Groves did at the Vuelta in addition to that to even be in the discussion to win. For me, a little bit less. For me, if he'd won Kerner... Or Omlo. Really? Kerner? Yeah. And then, <laughs> but then also something like Britannia Classic, Quebec. I know that's stat padding, but it's also... I do think stat padding is important. Like... I was born in Frankfurt. Yeah, I do think... <laughs> I do think so. Like, you can't say, oh, well, he has to win Lombardia because it's not realistic for a sprinter. <laughs> but maybe you're right. It's like, win Roubaix, win three of the opening Giro week ones sprints, win... Um, was there ever a year where Cavendish was eligible for being a best rider, you reckon, then? Because, like, maybe the year he became world champion? Yeah, exactly. If you win world championships, like, for example, in 2009, you know, according to PCS ranking, he was uh, number the third best rider in the world. And that year he won 23 races, of which uh, I think, like, over 10 were at world tour level, and he won one, two, three, four. He won six tour stages, three Giro yeah. stages, and San Remo. Yeah, that's that's yeah. it, isn't it? That's it. What year was that? 2009. 2009. What else? Two California in stages, two Renault stage, San Remo, three Giro stages, two Swiss stages, six tour stages, and then Tour of Missouri, I think, was. And then he won two of those. Like, what the fuck season is that? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> unless who won the tour in two thousand nine? Tour was Contador. She won Velta, I do not remember. I think that was the the Cobo Sebo. No, the the Froome one. So yeah, Contador won Pays Vasco. Yeah, this Cavendish season's better there for me. Contador. I feel like we'd have a lot more fun doing awards. Yeah, for we should years. do historical awards because we didn't get the chance to. <laughs> this is a Every really good one. Year. Was Mark Cavendish the best rider in 2009? That's an embrace debate. I think he was. Who was number one? He might have been. Oh. Bonin Roubaix in 2009. Was that the year Must after be... was Cancellara? Was it Bonin or Valverde in 2009? But no. Roubaix? I don't fucking know. Valverde! <laughs> so Valverde was the number one in PCS ranking in 2009. He won the Vuelta. He won the Vuelta. And, and the Dauphiné. all the hill classics, except... No, 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 he didn't actually. Really? No, he won the Vuelta, Catalunya, Dauphiné. So yeah, to me, it's about, it's a uh, Cav. Yeah, it might actually be. Because I don't there give There we go. It. Yeah. That's what a sprinter should do to okay, win Okay, we ranking. have the exact, no, <laughs> we have the exam, because I saw people asking on Twitter, what's the sprinter got to do to win it? So, well, there you go. Yeah. A monument <laughs> and nine Grand Tour stages across two different Grand Tours. Yeah, and Green I think Jersey. That's fair. Yeah, and green. Okay. Okay. Let's get to the riders that actually rode in 20. Uh, well, Cavendish did. Alejandro Valverde, Mark Cavendish. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the riders that actually performed to be competitive for yeah. the first three spots here. 
Let's start with Pogacar for a second. Pogacar did quite a bit of things. Most importantly, getting second at the Tour de France is a pretty, uh, pretty important result. Winning Lombardia, winning RVV in one of the most impressive RVV wins that I've seen yeah, in a while. Unbelievable, yeah. He won Amstel and Flesh, but let's be honest, those are not no, LBLs. They, not, they are large one. They are large one-day World Tour races. For me, Flesh is on the level of Omlo and Amstel on the level of E3. Yeah. But they can act as tiebreakers. I, I use them as tiebreakers. So if two <laughs> riders have two monuments each, for example. Yeah, but do you rate Lombardia and RVV the same as Roubaix and MSR? I don't. Mm, MSR is a bit of a lottery, like Jasper Sturvin and Morich won it too. I don't, I don't know. know. I find MSR harder to win than Lombardia. I, I mean, have Roubaix and RVV clear. And then world champs above them, probably. So, but what about his other races, Wait, Benji? So, you what, winning Andalusia, like he started winning Classica here and won three stages of Andalusia and GC. Do you not, you don't consider that at all? I consider that the same as I consider for Vingega, uh, Gran, Gran Camino, Camino, for example, and or whatever Vanderpool the other. Super 8. <laughs> Vanderpool Super 8 Classic, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing, the thing is also, when you look at Vanderpool, what has he done? He's got the combination of MSR, Rube, and World Championships in one year. Yeah. And if we take a look at that from a one-day racer perspective, I have to go back to... Let's go into history for a second. I want you to open whatever website you like, PCS, First Cycling, and type in Cancellara, and take a look at the 2010 season, won the ITT World Championships in Australia. So, uh, in your home. He uh, won an ITT at the Tour de France, won the first ITT on the yellow jersey, also at the Tour de France. But he won Roubaix, RVV, and the ITT World Championships. That's one year that could be considered competitive with Van Poel, I'd say. Then I'm saying 2005 Bonin, if I recall correctly? Was that the year where he got he World Worlds. Championships? In addition to... Two two stages. Yes. Roubaix and RVV. Oh, exactly. that season is fucking good. Whew. And maybe the other season you could consider for Bonin is 2012, but I don't think that hits as hard because the World Championships is not involved. He got the, the actual classics there, if I recall correctly, like RVV, can be able to get me three and Roubaix in one season, which is pretty good. But <laughs> Pretty insane, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at those, and Vanderpool's season this year is in the top two for me in that. He's fighting Bonin in 2005. No, Bonin in 2005 is superior. It's because, only slightly. Because he won the two Cobble Classics. Vanderpool wasn't even unlucky in RVV. Pagacha straight up ruined him in RVV. Yeah. Bonin won both. And so that to me matters more than San Remo. Even though you can say, well, Vanderpool okay. destroyed him in San Remo. Yeah. I think that's, that's Poggy, viable to say. Poggy was the person on Poggio who opened that race. And was super aggressive, and then that allowed Vanderpool to counter. And he lost, yeah, and he lost. I accept. But then Bonin also won E3. He also was, uh, he also won two tour stages. So he went to the Tour de France and won there, and he won the World Championships. But then how much do you rate Vanderpool showing up and being a big factor in Philipson no. having four Sorry, stages? this is the best rider of the year award, not You're you not were a nice, helpful teammate. All. No. Because oh, he, okay. he wasn't good enough to win. So he had to be a domestique. He wasn't good enough in the tour. He's on a, he uses training. It's the biggest race of the year. I don't fully agree that he wasn't good enough to win anything at the tour. Why didn't he? I, he, he was focused on trying to get the team as many victories as possible. <laughs> Come on. That matters. It's like the, Wout van Aert Tour de France 2022. You think if Alperson, the guy who, the reason they get the sponsor money is him. Not Jasper Philipson. I you think if he that. was good enough to get to win a stage, he wouldn't have been. I think, he, you, I have think you have to rate Vanderpool season highly because of the combination of those three. One there is. I do. I agree. But the leadouts to me is not a positive. That's in fact really, especially compared to it's different I to Vingegaard. Positively, Vingegaard was good enough to win the Vuelta. He chose not to. Vanderpool was not good enough to be as competitive at the tour as he was in 2021, where he took yellow. So, he was a selfless teammate and helped Philipson win stages. So if you take a look at Vingegaard, you spoke about the Tour de France and the Vuelta combination. 
Obviously, he's done a lot next to that. We got to take a look at that afterwards. But the Tour Velta combination is, in my opinion, something that has shown to be more possible than winning all three of those classics in the last two decades. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's not very impressive. It is very impressive. Let that be clear. I believe it was possible already last year. But you're looking up riders that did it. I think Froome did it. Froome did it in I 17. I think Contador yeah. did it. I think, well, did it at some point. Uh, Froome did three in a row, if I recall correctly. Tour, Velt, and then Giro. Yep. So that's pretty impressive, but that doesn't count because it's in different years. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure Contador did do it. Really? Maybe they scrubbed. Maybe in one of the years that... <laughs> they scrubbed his results. It might be, actually. I don't know. They scrubbed one year of results, if I recall correctly. Yeah. No, I don't think he did it in, that, in the, the year that he had the Clambuterol um, erasure. So, he did Giro Velta. That's different. Tour Velta is better, yeah. obviously. Yeah, but let's look at Vingegaard's season then, if we're yeah. going to allude to it. So it opens up yeah. very similar to Poggy with a Spanish you know, preparation race, three stages and wins. Great, fantastic for both of them. Paranis goes there, uh, doesn't win a road stage, comes third in GC, and Pogaccia wins three road stages and GC ahead of him. So clearly superior there. Vingegaard then comes back, pass country, three stages and GC. So I would now say... He's back level with Poggy at that point. But then Poggy goes mm -hmm. and crushes the Spring Classics, <laughs> Hills and Cobbles. Yeah. Vingar goes to Dauphiné, two stages, and GC with the biggest margin in uh, a long time in a one, one week. And Basque and Dauphiné really was dominant. And then the Tour de France uh, wins the TT one stage and wins GC. Vuelta wins two stages and second on GC and in my opinion was the best overall GC rider at the Vuelta. So yeah, I think everybody agrees. That's his season. That. Uh, not everybody might agree with that, that he was the best overall GC rider. I think for me, it's important to say that if this ranking was made with Vingo at the top, with Pogacar at the top or Vanderpool at the top, I'd probably be like, I can see why you put that rider yeah. at the top. At every single one of those riders, each of those riders would deserve to be shouted as the, the best rider of 2023. Who is inherently the best rider as a cyclist? I think that's Pogacar, but that's a different question. I'm talking about 2023 taking success and results in, in matter, and then I rate... Oh, it's all really fucking well, well, close, on that isn't point, it? for example, if people say, well, Poggy crashed in Liège and so he wasn't at his best in the tour. Yeah. That's, happens, eh? Yeah, for, for this discussion, that's too bad, so sad. Obviously, in the Ramco future... Ramco had COVID at the Giro. Yeah. For the future, we take that into account, and that doesn't mean that he isn't the best rider in the world, but for best rider in 23, yeah. it, it matters. that, And that's just, you know, unfortunate for him. So I think you could do it in a... It's really, it's hard to compare volume because like Poggy has the most volume, right? Yeah. In terms of uh, World Tour wins this year, Poggy has three, four, five, six, seven, ten World Tour wins, including mm -hmm. two monuments, including a World Week GC and two, uh, three one day, well, uh, four one day World Tour, st sorry, two non-monument one day races. That's a handful. Yeah. Um, Flesh and Amstel. He is big target of the year tour. He didn't win. And then Vanderpool is the less. Oh, I don't know. I really, I change my mind every time I think about it, Benji, as well. <laughs> I think this is really difficult. And then like Vanderpool won six races this year, two yeah. of which at world tour level, one at world champs level. It's just to me, not every, an, enough volume. Every single one of his victories was the goal he set out to win. Except the Tour that, of Flanders, yeah. Except for Tour of Flanders. I agree with that. <sighs> and the thing with Vanderpool is also, just the combination of those three races in one season matters to me. Maybe yeah. it's my Belgian classics blood that starts showing up when I talk about classics. But I genuinely feel like I want to give it to Vanderpool as a consequence of that combination of the three in a single year. Now, if... Yeah... With Vingegaard, it's also, yeah, he pulled him to Vuelta, but in 
let's be honest about it, he could have won the Vuelta. The Tour de France Vuelta double is, a, is an important one. Pogacar would have probably won it if he goes to the Vuelta and has a podium in GC, for example, or, pro or, or fights for the victory. Maybe, yeah. If he wins the Vuelta, I think yes. Yeah. But for me, Poggy, Poggy's GC this year is the mm -hmm. same as Adam Yates, right? A podium at the Tour yeah, and a World Tour one week. That, that's, that's, the no, that's the knock on Poggy. That, that's from the view of us that don't care about second or third. For us, podium is a podium, well, right? Yeah, yeah, like it's much of a much. In reality, Poggy was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jonas for two weeks. Yeah. Adam Yates was not. But yeah. on, the, on the raw Palmares, you know, he, he comes out with... He just is missing that extra GC stuff. And that's because of the crash in Liège. It meant he couldn't go to Swiss and win. He couldn't go to the Dauphiné and win. Um, so that's the knock on Poggy. The knock on Jonas is he didn't do a one-day race and, <laughs> and, and didn't win the Vuelta. Yeah. And didn't win the Vuelta. So what's your list? We got, we got to, we've danced around it. I find it really difficult, man. Can I, can't I just put all three on number one and just have no one be angry at me at the end of this podcast? That <laughs> people would be are going to be nice angry. To do. They're going to be angry about this stuff we already said. 33% of people are going to be angry with... So we better do it. We better do a different one so that then only... Yeah, only a third of the people are angry. So we... Otherwise, if we pick the same, maybe 66% Wait, of people will be angry. If, we, if I go outside and I find someone random on the street to give a third prediction or a third result... With the third rider, then nobody's angry. Yeah, that would true. be clever, right? Eh? True. Anyway. We, maybe Luke. Yeah, Luke will have Olav Koy, Zylard, Fabio <laughs> Jakobs. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it. I'm going to go with. Your gut says Vanderpool. That's, that's what you've been arguing the My whole time. My gut says time. Vanderpool. I have Vingegaard on second because the Tour de France matters more to me than. The Fleshes and Amstels and all those kind of races all combined. And I have Pogaccio in third, even though I believe he's the best rider in the world. And Roglic fourth, Remco fifth. Uh, I have Roglic in fourth, yeah. His success this season is yeah. undeniable. Uh, and when it comes to Remco, yeah, winning LBL, winning World Championship time trial. Yeah. He's, uh, he's won... He's a monument away, like a solid monument away from Vanderpool. Maybe we're nah, going to really. Phillips in there with, uh, with the fifth spot. Because he podiumed Roubaix, eh? He podiumed Roubaix. <laughs> he won Brugge de Pana. Well, <laughs> sorry, but I don't give a fuck about Brugge de Pana. Yeah, but it's a sprinter classic, you know? And he... It's like a Super 8 classic. Yeah, but there also is a lot of farming in there too, like four turkey stages. So, yeah. Yeah, we can debate fifth. If you've got Phillips in there, I won't disagree with you. Yeah, I have I have Remco fifth, Roglic fourth, Pogaccia third, the same as you. He just that Liege crash, I think, really hurt him. And then I have yeah. Van der Poel second because of the tour. And Vingegaard first. If Pogaccia wins Liege and doesn't crash out, is he winning? No, nah, then, then I need him maybe? to do the Vuelta. I, then it would have been more important to me if he didn't win Lombardia and went to yeah. the Vuelta and, and, and beat Vingegaard and Roglic there. Then it's like, to me, clear number one. Yeah. But he didn't. Anyway, a lot of people will disagree. Post it in the comments below if you hate us now. And uh... If Van der Poel won a tour, <laughs> him, Van der Poel and Vingegaard to me is almost a wash. But... I think it's not just in the Palmares, Vingas, but, but Vingegaard you, was the best GC rider probably this century, right? You care a lot more about GC versus classics than I do, I think. I think I, my heart cares about classics, but not really about the, the Fletchers and Amstels in the world, but like the, the historical monuments, my heart cares about that. I think there's an element of randomness in the classics more so than in a three-week race. Now, that also counts favorably to Vanderpool because he won maybe the hardest one-day race to win San Remo. He won it. Um, but also with Roubaix, there's a, there's a huge element of luck there. And yeah, but it's also not correct because I've seen this comment before to say that it's harder... 
to win a three week race than a one day race. I saw that to, that before. That's I think that's a twisty statement. I think I think it's the opposite. If you are the best, it's easier for that to show out in in three weeks. You have enough stages for the for the luck to average out. I think out. so too. Whereas, but easier is also eh, I don't like the term because it's not easy. Eh? It's different. But you know, world champs. Fuck, he was good too. So, you know, in World Champs, he crashed. He crashed after his attack and still took more time with a broken yeah. shoe. So, yeah, really, they're close to me. If, if Van der Poel had won a tour stage... Yeah, I get that. Then I put him ahead. But when I look at six wins, three at World Tour level, it's just not enough volume to me. Um, yep. So I understand where you're coming from. And also Vingegaard, and even, he, he didn't fluke into anything, Vingegaard. Like, he also was, in his stage races, not too bad. And even with people that say Bogatra is first, I could probably agree in some shape or form, but I just don't rate Lombardia the same as I do Roubaix, RVV, and MSR. Yeah, For me, Roubaix is know worth the best 10 class. Lombardias. Yeah. Well, maybe not 10, but... 20. Yeah, Roubaix is... It's a big race. <laughs> it's a really, really big race, and yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe that's the that is the argument. That's why I accept if people say, "Well, Vanderpool put as you said, put these three historical one day races together, and all three of them you can be beset by bad luck, and there's no re there's no do over tomorrow where you can take time back." And he yeah. won those three. Yeah, it's impressive, and and also you know, but and to also, me, RVV yeah. is also if he wins. Sorry, if he wins, obviously yeah. RVV. No, end of discussion. Very easy award show. Uh, he, he's the clear best, but he didn't. One thing is clear. All three of these riders won races where 99% of the other riders, if they won one of them, would arrive and say, oh, I've made my career today. Yeah, right? yeah. Exactly. Monuments, World Championships, even GC. Honestly, even one-week World Tour races are enough to make a guy's career and get, give them a 10 years of very, very good contracts. Same so much luck. <laughs> yeah, Spielach, yeah, the goat. Um, who is... <laughs> is anyone disrupting these three next year, Benji? No. Who's, who's the most likely to... I think the most likely to fall out of the three is Vanderpool because of that element of randomness with the one-day yeah. results. I agree. I think it's hard to replicate the season that he had. And you see that when you look at the, the Palmareses of Bona and Cancellara. They had a very hard time replicating those seasons. Like, they had years where they won monuments again, but they didn't win the combination of three of those races, for example. And that's why I think Vanderpool is the most likely to drop out. I also think that Jonas Vingegaard is the more... is also in a vulnerable spot where one crash can kill his entire... like, can happen for every single one of these three yeah. riders, but... Being a Tour de France GC rider with the Velta combination, you can lose out on both so easily. While if you're Vanderpool and you crash out for six months at the start of the year, you might still be able to win the World Championships and some, some race at the end of the year. That makes sense? Yeah. Well, that's why the one-day riders next year have got an extra thing they can add to their, their argument with the Olympics, both uh, road race and, and TT, I guess. So, But how much do you value the Olympics versus the World Championships? Yeah, I value it. How much? Probably I have it at RVV level. Okay. I see that. It really is I... like, it, and, I, and I know that riders, they are thinking about it now as well. Like they, a lot of riders are riding down, I want to be in good shape for the Olympics. I want to make selection. They're asking their teams but that. I feel like you might also be from the... The Australian bias in that. Does it make sense? As well, in I know how big the Olympics is. Yeah, in for cycling, for people to know who the cyclist is, whereas I know in Australia, people don't know what an RVV is. Yeah, I get that. Well, in Flanders, I think people would consider RVV bigger than the Olympics. Yeah, like, do you think, would Van Aert rather win RVV or Olympics road race in Paris? I reckon RVV. RVV? Yeah, I agree. I'd but still, rather it... win RVV or Roubaix. Than either of those. Not not realistic. I'm not gonna win either of them. But, but yeah, it, it it's it's still a it's a damn big race. It's it's to yeah. me it's it's not Amstel. It's a it's way above the 
the Amstel and Fleshes of this world or E3. Yeah. Maybe it's in his own category. I don't know. But that's a big one uh, next year. Obviously, Van der Poel and, and Van Aert. And may, maybe Arno De Lee steps up, Benji. You know, we remember how strong he was in Omlope where he crashed and came back. I don't see it nah. yet. He will step in, up, but not in that way. In theory, he should be good in in a lot of these. First Grand Tour stage victory, maybe combined with combined with a, a an omelope or E three, maybe I don't know E three. I don't really believe omelope. I see viable omelope. Yeah, I think that suits him. Omelope Kerner and uh, three dark three dark Brugge de Pana Coxeda. Oh, classic. <laughs> Did you just invent two classics together? Yes. Coxeda classic and Brugge three dark de I swear that's what it used to be called. Um, it might have actually have been. <laughs> they changed the names of these so many times. Like Super Eight, what yeah. is Super Eight? Can you? <laughs> I just um, saw... the Super Eight Classic. It's what was a that again? Metropole? Race. Yeah, you're a Euro Metropole too. Yeah, whatever the fuck that is. Or or was that that was the GP Impanis from Petiham? <laughs> Fictional. From Petiham was a pretty good cyclist, but the Primus Classic. That's Primus. what it was called. <laughs> I think we got to do it's this. Had three names. <laughs> I think we got to do this uh, argument for other other years. Like I reckon, I'm down. yeah, this would be better than me doing a. I don't know. No offense. 2023 is so. But like an intermarche preview or arguing whether Cavs 2009 season was the best. <laughs> I think we need to do both. <laughs> yeah, probably. What, need what to do year both. are you thinking of? Like the first one you think of. Probably 2011? 2011, 2011, yeah, yeah, 2011. You just want an Australian to have a chance, don't you? Well, no, it's more when when there's the Tour de France winner isn't completely stacked, Palmares wise. That's when it's interesting. Yeah. But uh, you know, when the Tour de France winner also then goes and does other things, it's usually difficult to because that's going to be the argument, Benji. Oh, you overrate the Tour de France, but like you know how important the Tour de France is. Like, there's, yeah. it is, it should be overweighted. It is, it has an outsized importance in the sport. Um, yeah, that's for certain. But yeah, that's, uh, I think that's the end of our men's awards. We've got the women's awards coming up. Uh, best team, <laughs> going to be hard to go, go past them. But to be honest, best rider, maybe we'll be going against the grain because some people had, uh, or maybe Benji will. He's known to be a little bit biased to the Belgians sometimes. So I've said uh, the exact opposite, but you're gonna have to hear it in the next podcast, yeah, think, right? Yeah, we've teased it there. Um <laughs> at least well no, oh no, Kopecky won the Crystal. Oh, but that's only for Belgians. That was, you have your own award show, right? Uh, I think there's two award shows. You have or I have my own, or Belgium have their Belgium own. Belgium has your own, you just had it. Uh, two. I think there's the Cristal and Fitz and the Gala van der Flandria. I had an invite yesterday to Gala van der Flandria. Wait, but... Also, Flanders has its own little one. So, Haaland has Cristal and Fitz, and at okay. Newsblad, the other newspaper has Gala <laughs> van der Flandria. And uh, Philipson won the Flandria prize over Evenepoel. Interesting. I don't mind I it, to be honest. I don't know. I'm not so sure about that one. Well, like, for the Flandria prize, shouldn't the... A cobble classic have outsized importance compared to Le <laughs> oh, but Liège is also in Belgium, but it's Flanders, so they don't acknowledge Liège because it's in it's in Wallonia. If I speak, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Did you is you was you were ever eligible for that? I'm pretty sure in 2012 he probably won. Did Leo win all five classics and then we're like, you don't win it, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Florian Vermeersch won Brugge de Banner. <laughs> nah, it's not Jesus like it's not Christ. how it is, is it? Um, alrighty. That's our award show. We're the final one, obviously the correct one, and we'll be back with the Women's Awards uh, in no time. But thanks for listening as always, and we'll see you with that then. Ciao.